hey, here we are. In the course of this past year, I have had a, a mix of influential people like authors and musicians and entrepreneurs. And I've had people with unique, fascinating stories, uh, like a, a surf photographer who who was stricken with a rare neurological condition that left him paralyzed. Uh, I spoke with one of the first female game rangers in South Africa. They've all been interesting in their own way, but influential people on one hand and fascinating stories on the other don't necessarily overlap. Actually, it, it usually doesn't. Uh, it's usually one or the other. Not today. Today, it's both <laughs> in many ways. My guest is Petra Velsabor. Uh, she has been a TEDx talk speaker at Oxford. She is a mental health consultant, an executive coach, a psychotherapist, a CEO. That's enough to get her on the show right there. But before all of that, she was raised in a religious cult, a real one, a real deal, a quite famous one, actually, originally known as the Children of God. Notable former members raised in the cult include Joaquin and River Phoenix uh, when they were children, as well as uh, Rose, a actress Rose McGowan. Multiple documentaries have been produced on the group. Former members have accused the group of child sexual abuse, physical abuse, exploitation, the targeting of vulnerable people, creating lasting trauma among children. At one point in time, the group used what uh, is termed flirty fishing and uh, evangelistic tactic where female members were sent out to use their sex appeal, which included sometimes actual sex, not always, with men outside the group to seek donations or actual conversions to the cult. And the cult, the group still exists today, by the way. It's referred to as the Family International. On their website under history, it simply notes that it has had a colorful history without mentioning any of the well-documented details I've just described. Petra is so much more than this backstory, however, and we will get into that as well. Her mental health advocacy, her business, her public speaking. It's a lot to pack into a half hour, so let me shut up now and let her speak. She joins me now from London. Thank you, Petra, for coming on. Thank you so much. That was quite well researched and gave a full kind of backstory, even for even before like I was born. And uh, interesting, I haven't looked at the website recently. You can imagine why. Um, mm -hmm. But interesting that that's the catchphrase: a colorful history. That's uh, to it. say the, to say the least. Thank you yeah. for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on. So, uh, did you literally you grew up? Are your earliest memories of of being were your parent <clears throat> your parents members? Yeah. Yeah, so born and raised. So um, my, my mother had um, uh, joined prior to my older sister being born. She was in Holland. It was really off the back of the hippie movement, right? So people were looking for, for meaning. They were looking for connection. And if we think about, they were looking for purpose. And if we think about a lot of cults um, kind of started in those uh, counterculture days where it was like, it started with loads of idealism, loads of good purpose. Uh, and really, if you see some early videos of just like the music and the connection and people all being joined in one purpose, um, it's, you know, it, it makes people feel good. It makes people feel like they're part of something. And so a few years in, so that started in the late 70s. I was born in 80. Uh, and so some of the, the, the more extreme sort of things that you talk about, the, the flirty fishing and some of those concepts were already starting to dwindle, basically because they had lots of kids. But certainly a sexualized environment the the rules and ideas connecting religion and god to sex and often sexualizing women certainly has had a a, a sort of whole length of, of trauma in my generation as we try and figure out how to live in the real world and, and find purpose within it so what what years then are we talking you were born in 80 and then at um at what point what at what point did you you realize something's not right here. This isn't normal. So this is what people don't really understand because they're like, well, shouldn't you have known? But imagine if that is your entire reality. Right. That's what you, you were born in. We didn't go to school. So we were protected from outside influences, right? And so your whole world is reinforced by this mechanism that we are the normal people right. and everybody on the outside are the ones that need to be saved. They're um, confused. They're um, you know, following a system that is um, materialistic and just the whole spin on it is very us versus them. And so it wasn't until I was a teenager, really. I mean, there were little sparks because certain people who dissented or didn't believe 
would kind of disappear or would be excommunicated or would be exercised or, you know, just little mm -hmm. things like that. But still the messaging, like every morning we would have what we call devotions, which essentially was indoctrination into the belief system, right? right? And so people were made examples of, and you, you begin as a child to think, well, in order to belong and be safe, I'm going to follow what every, everybody is doing. And it's only until later that you go, oh, we're the minority. Everybody mm. is living a different kind of life. And it was probably... Um, when I was 17, 18, 19, so I've traveled, I've lived in Kenya, Russia, all over Europe, um, India, Brazil, like this is the, the world that I grew up in, mm -hmm. um, helping other people. There was like, people want to paint it all with a dark brush, but you know, I'm one of five siblings. We had a really close family. We had loads of adventures. It was exciting. There was loads of music, community, right? And so I had to learn later on that you know, you've got to hold, you can hold both in one, you know, I had good memories and there were dark things that ended up leading me to a place of addiction, suicidal ideation, uh, hopelessness, despair, not knowing where I fit in and needing to build my life up from that point. Yeah. Well, you, <clears throat> you've alluded to some of the sort of abnormalities, like you, you were basically denied an education. Uh, you're obviously a very educated person now, so you caught, you caught back up, but, uh, you know, what were some of the other, and you've talked about the, um, the sort of sex exploitation, I guess you could, you could phrase it. Uh, what were some of the other abnormalities of growing up in, in that environment? I mean, what, I guess everyone you were friends with throughout your childhood also were, were in the group, right? I mean, you didn't have friends that weren't in the group, right? And if you did, your purpose was to save them. So you, it could be under the guise of friendship, but essentially you're, you always had this radar of like, get them saved, bring them in, make them understand you. So it was never like an equal, I can just be myself. Who, who was myself is the first question, yeah, right? right? <laughs> but, but the other point which you may relate to, given your background, is the <laughs> Ar Armageddonist side yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. So it was very much, we were being trained as end time soldiers to save the world, like no pressure, right? So you're a kid and like, this is your path. And nobody ever asked us, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Like that was not a question. It was right. like, this is your path. You keep training for it. One day, you know, Armageddon's gonna happen. The world's gonna end, you know, um, which is hilarious given the pandemic and given, you know, all the things that are going on. And a lot of us are just like, meh, you know, <laughs> we've, been, we've been preparing for this our whole lives sort of yeah. thing. Um, so that was probably, maybe the key feature, like I remember, you know, every three years for some reason, the world was supposed to end, there was some countdown and then it wouldn't happen. And then there would be some narrative about how God wow. spared us. And, you know, from the, you know, he gave us a little bit of a longer chance because he favored us or, you know, something like that. And the way this showed up was like, I saw in my generation doing a three year degree seemed unfathomable. It's like, why would you commit would to you something for that long? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Relationships would end mysteriously at the three year mark. You know, it's just like these patterns of behavior of like this shortness of time and the sense of urgency mm. rather than like, hey, I can plan to retirement. Like, so these core concepts that might not seem, well, they may seem very radically different, but there's, can you see like, it, it, it's just, it ends up affecting your entire life, even though you've maybe broken away from the concepts. Yeah, I I remember when I was, uh, you know, twelve or thirteen during the first Gulf War, the like nineteen ninety one, in my little Southern Baptist church, there were people that were drawing comparisons to, uh, or linking that in some way to uh, prophecy in the Book of Revelation, and like yeah. you know, I remember being twelve and thirteen, like scared to go to sleep, thinking, "It's the end of the world. I haven't lived my life yet. Wait." <laughs> yeah. And, you yeah. know, and I know someone and I, I'm not going to out them. I, don't, I doubt they listen to this show, but uh, I've, I've been friends with them for many, many years. And they have bought into uh, apocalyptic predictions. They uh, they thought the Mayan calendar was going to run out December 21st, 2012. Yeah, yeah, all of it. And then they keep and then uh, this person thought that the rapture was going to happen in December of 2020. And I was like, what? you know, how do you know that? And, you know, what happens when it doesn't? And the, I won't go too far down this rabbit hole, but the big thing to me <laughs> is that, you know, that 100% of the predictions of the end of the world have been wrong. It's been every yeah. time it's wrong. 
Like what would what would make you think this is the one time that it's accurate? But anyway, I get frustrated. But, it's, <laughs> but it strangely gives people a sense of purpose. And I feel like in this world, because I've tried to understand from my parents' point of view, because they weren't evil, manipulative, or all of the things that on the outside you might think they are. They, they weren't. They were idealistic teenagers who joined a movement for change. And over time, there was this chipping away like that they don't go into this extreme thinking from day one and go right. hey this is all the things you're joining they right. go hey feel the love that you've never felt before and right. the connection and the purpose and then slowly it's like well if you want to keep the connection and belonging you got to keep believing this because otherwise you're going to be ostracized from the tribe mm -hmm. and now they've given up their resources their finances their educations like anything that would give them a chance at a life over there so it becomes harder and harder to actually go, I'm going to start from scratch and lose my entire community and network. And that's yeah. essentially what I had to do. I, I had to push everyone away for a little while and go, what do I even think? Like, I need to have space to figure that out. And um, incidentally, I became pregnant at the same time with, with a partner who wasn't um, involved in, in the movement. And so I now have a child to raise with a belief system that's confused. Like, I don't know what I believe in, but now I've got another human to, to impart wisdom to. So that was really the real dark time in my life where I was like, who am I? And, you know, I'd convince myself my own kids would be better off without me. Um, and, and we have to get to these kind of rock bottom moments in a way to then go, okay, what is my responsibility when it comes? Because I could sit in victim mode my entire life trauma, sexualized behavior, Armageddonist, no backup from, from family, you know, no mm -hmm. education. Um, and, and this is, I guess, what I advocate for in the mental health space is no matter what's in your past or the reasons that you have poor mental health, what are the things that you can take responsibility for? Radical responsibility, because those are the ways that I could slowly build my life and, like you said, get an education and, and move into this, this space. Well, um what was the specific catalyst, the turning point uh, that's gotten, gotten you to where you were, are today? Uh, I mean, because the transition I know was not easy and, uh, and you've, you've spoken about that. I've uh, heard about on other, uh, um, on another program or on a talk on YouTube or something that where you, there was a, a specific day where you woke up at 6 a.m. and you, you really wanted it to be over. You wanted the day yeah. to already be over. And you did a, a one-year deal that you made with yourself. Talk about that. What, what was yeah. it? Yeah. Well, so there, you know, there was several rock bottom moments where I put my kids in danger, where I was putting myself in danger, really reckless and drinking and you know, all, all sorts of things. Um, and yeah, that day, and I, I don't like, I always say it's not my advice to people to give a personal deal to yourself as a psychotherapist, <laughs> but for some reason, I just thought, okay, I'm going to postpone taking my life. I've got nothing left to lose. Like this is now a valid option for me in my head. Um, but I'm going to give it one year and I, I've still got that valid option. But in that year, and, and remember the thought came, but then it's a slow build. It's not like this massive epiphany of like, now I knew how that year was going to go. It was just like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to try all the things that people say that support your mental health. Because people, people say like, hey, meditate, um, move your body, learn something, connect, find meaning, be honest. That was a big one. Because <laughs> imagine the shame of right. my background. Like I was wearing the mask of like middle class mother, mm -hmm. right? And slowly dying because on the end, I was like, nobody can know where I came from. Right. And it's that secrecy that really kind of spirals you, you out of control in a way. And so, and, and I say this on the talk, like my, that year came and went, life was not perfect but I learned a few things. So I learned that we can teach ourselves to be happy. We can find fulfillment. Like there's a lot that we can do no matter what trauma we're experiencing or what's in our past. And so from then I, I had that foundation building blocks. And so I just kept going with curiosity, education, experimenting. It's not a one size fits all, but do the work. And my mm -hmm. life's radically different. Yeah. Uh, did is was it during that year that you basically severed all ties with the the cult i i severed t ties before that and so part of that i think led to my depression because i lost um my any sense community. of community or yeah. like i had no 
reinforcement that I had any normal bits to me, right? And so mm -hmm. now I'm in a world where I've got to pretend the whole time. So I'd already cut off. Um, I will say my mom and you know a few people were were in my life from my immediate family, mm -hmm. but they lived in different countries and weren't you know around. Um, and so I'd already cut cut off from people, and it was much later that I could kind of reintegrate or reconnect with people who'd left, or, or you mm. know, even even family, that sort of thing. Yeah, alcoholics go through a kind of similar thing where, um, you know, they want to give up drinking because it's ruining their lives, it's wrecking their lives. The problem is all of their friends like to drink, and so you don't just give up drinking. That's not only that. That's not the only difficult thing you got to kind of give up your friends too and find a whole new set of friends which make you know makes the overcoming the problem like doubly hard but agreed yeah. you then get lo loneliness and isolation which is terrible for your mental health and so you've got to build that up real slow well let's uh let's talk about what you do today you're an amazing speaker um and you know to highlight your ted talk uh it's entitled three ways to live the life you want uh, I, I've listened to it. I love it. Um, for my listeners, what, what are those three ways in it? I mean, you don't have to give any spoilers away. They trust should me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you don't have them, I've got, them, I've got them. Prepared. Yeah, I'm good. But, but yeah, what, what are basically the, what's the gist of the three ways? Well, the, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on one of the main ways. And, and that for me is practicing bravery. And so, you know, sometimes we, we think, um, you know, you've got to try all these things, but I quite like the narrative around courage and bravery because my courage could be being honest about myself to one person. It could be super small. And people sometimes look at the, those with the great lives and they think, I'm just not like them, right? They're like this, this, and this. They were born with X, Y, and Z qualities, right? And so I'm just, I mean, it's too far. And so not enough people talk about the messy middle, those, the little steps every day. Like it would be brave for me to um, be honest to do three minutes of meditation to bring my cortisol down, um, to go to school. Like, can you imagine, like for me as an adult going into an edu the education sector, like I would look at desks and like um, lecture halls and just be like, holy shit, how am I here, <laughs> right? And other uh, people are like, meh, whatever, it's my second degree or, you know, could, they, could they you learned. Watch, were you allowed to watch movies when you were growing up? Oh, Jesus Christ. The movies I watched were like um, The Ten Commandments. Oh, okay. Like anything like that. So you were watching like, like The Breakfast Club or something like where they're no, in a classroom no. where they're getting... No, although we had like, when I was a bit later a teenager, we had like contraband music that we would sneak around and, you know, <laughs> like we would like listen to stuff on our Walkmans and just try and sneak it in. <laughs> I'm old enough. When I was a kid, I had, uh, I, I mentioned before we started recording that I had grown up in the Southern Baptist Church, and, and I'm not here to bash anybody that's still in that, uh, that particular uh, group, but, uh, but when I was growing up, my, I had an aunt who was, I mean, hardcore fundamentalist, like more than your average, say, Southern Baptist, and uh, so she was into like the backward masking on music do you know where you like you would run the oh, record yeah. backwards and hear right and hear yes. devil's yes. messages in it and yes. i'm like you know you were talking about growing up in a cult in this the only kind of world you knew so you couldn't even really uh compare you know, right you couldn't realize that you were living in a kind of abnormal environment same similar uh at least when i was young i thought that was reality you know so yeah. for a little while i was like scared to like you know if Ozzy Osbourne came on or something like, oh no, that's, that's yeah. the devil's going to infiltrate me. my mind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I so much it. fear, so much fear and coercion that you don't really realize until you're unpicking it and you realize your viewpoint is so left field. Um, but what I will say is there was a time when I like, like shut it all off and was like, that is no part of me. I am building mm -hmm. up this person. But now I've realized through, through therapy and you know, all, the, all the work, it's like, actually, it gave me some gifts. So mm. I grew up in lots of countries. Like I have edge, like I'm able to take risks as an entrepreneur. I'm able to um, um, kind of connect with people from any background, from any level of your business. Give me your CEO, VP, or your, your janitor. And it's mm. just like, it's just people, like I've got it. So mm. I almost got a head start in, in living in communities and managing people in, in groups, teams, like, and so this has really given me an edge in my business now, supporting companies globally, 
to create mm -hmm. mentally healthy work environments. That's really what I'm about. And you can see there's a fine line between a culty environment, which is <laughs> toxic and, you know, we can compare it to corporates, right? Right, right. Um, and so I've got like this, like this third eye insight into these places really easily. Whereas other people, they've got to learn it from a book and it's a different ball game. Yeah, you said something or I read somewhere uh, about that people have this fear of being open about mental health in the workplace there that I guess it's going to make the workplace too emotional or something in it and it's it's actually the opposite result or something like that but can you speak more to that yeah so you know people think if we talk about something suddenly people are taking time off work like nobody's productive everyone's crying like these are the fears <laughs> that that it's leaders and apart. managers have yeah, yeah it's all gonna fall apart um but what actually happens is when I talk about mental health I'm not just talking about mental illness I'm talking about the health of our mind. Like if we invest in our, our resilience, our capability, our honesty, our integrity, resilience, like these are skills that we need to thrive in the changing workplace at the moment, right? And so actually talking about mental health is like, in my team, we'll ask each other, what's one thing you're grateful for? So we'll do like positive psychology. That's mental health too, right? right. And so it's kind of a re-education of what these conversations even look like. And we've had tears in our team and I've got PTSD and I've told my team and sometimes I don't act in the perfect way and I'll circle back and go, guys, it was a tough day for me. I shouldn't have done that. Like, how do we work together and move the mission forward? Right. Yeah. So it takes a vulnerable leader. It takes all of these sorts of things, but not talking about it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. It just means it shows up in other ways. Yeah, that's true. And I, I, w one thing I like, that you said earlier that you were, you know, you were at first when you were getting out of the, the group, uh, the cult that, you know, you didn't, you didn't want to tell anybody and you were afraid to tell anybody because you were worried about, you know, I, I can't, nobody's going to want to be around me, I guess, or whatever. Yeah. But, but the truth is what makes you so, uh, you know, appealing to talk to and, and, you know, want to know more about is that you are open about it now. You know, I mean, that's the sort of irony of it. It's like, you know, not and not in some sort of morbid curiosity, like, oh, tell me what a cult was like. But in that I, you know, I can relate. I, I, I didn't grow up in the same environment, but, you know, so much of your story of being vulnerable or being taken advantage of people, everybody can relate to that at some point yeah. in time in their lives in some way. So absolutely. People, uh, people can. And um, I think it's like I have to be honest for my own mental health. I know what the opposite feels like. And that's the other bit. It's like, great, you're so good at it. Like this used to be survival for me. Mm. Like I have to do this in order to not kill myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now it's a completely different ball game and we can see that it actually supports success in life. That's great. Well, um, Petra, every episode uh, or almost every episode, I try to do a small segment at the end called five minute Zen. Um, and it's, it's nothing too, uh, esoteric or anything. It's, uh, I, I just, you know, sometimes I talk about mindfulness being present, uh, acceptance, and I try to give some kind of practical advice, whether it's like meditate for three minutes or breathing exercise or something, uh, but something down to earth for people who aren't familiar with, um, mindfulness or Zen or whatever. The question I have for you today, specifically tailored for you, what do we do with shame and guilt? from our past. If we're feeling that, um, you know, if we're looking back on our past and we're feeling that shame, that guilt and regret, that, that horrible feeling, what's the first practical step of getting through it? What should we do? So remember, I was an alcohol addicted parent. So if you want to talk about cycles of abuse and, you know, regret and like guilt, like for me, it was like with my parenting and the things I had now inflicted, I couldn't blame, well, the past influenced it, but it, this was now my stuff. And right. so the first practical tip is, I would say if regret or shame didn't exist, how would I behave? And I know it's a, just a little practical coachy type question, but that helped me not get stuck in the oh, well, I'll just drink, man. There's no point. I've ruined their lives. I've ruined mine, like spiral of doom, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so if it didn't exist, what would I do? So your behavior can now start being that of a successful person who isn't held back by that. And over time, your feelings can catch up. Um, but also I would say kindness, like sometimes that shame is still going to come up. And um, just from a trauma perspective and Zen, 
meditation in its traditional format doesn't always work as effectively for us because focusing on breath and somatic experience is really hard and it Mm. brings up old trauma right Mm. and so finding techniques that work for you like i meditate and i just feel the tingling on my fingers that's what i focus on rather Mm. than my breath so i would just say experiment with some of these practices and find ways that work for you rather than going, I've got to try this way. I've got to listen to headspace or do it this way and then feel like a failure. And then your shame can come up and go, I can't even do that. Right. Yeah. I I love that actually. Um, And I, I tell people that too, that, you know, one thing that I don't promote is dogma as, as if, Hey, look, this is the way that you should do this. You know, the, the reality is find what works for you and, you know, and if it ain't working, do something else, you know? And, uh, like if, uh, you know, if I get too bogged down in an old memory and it happens to me too, you know, um, I just like, you know what, I'm going to stop what I'm doing right now and I'm going to go do something else. And I, I just make a shift and I just change up the environment. I change what I'm doing. And, you know, usually that, puts me in a different frame of mind. It it changes the, you know, because I I talk about too, that you're not your thoughts, you know, all kind of crazy stuff is going to pop in your head. Um, Don't, you know, don't get uh, um, imprisoned by them. Let them go in and go out. (laughs) And, and you, you know, you're not, you know, your thoughts show up like an annoying car horn outside or a bug that might come and get in your face or something. But it's not who you are. You're bigger and better than that. So anyway, I love your, your five minutes in there. The, uh, you know, uh, find what works for you. That's, that's great. Couldn't agree more. Well, what do you have going on these days? Uh, how can people find you? Um, I found you on LinkedIn, so I guess they can follow you there. Where else? Yeah, sure. Um, so LinkedIn is my happy place. That's where I put <laughs> out most of my content when it comes to workplace mental health. Um, I'm also on Instagram, but I'd say LinkedIn if you want to see most of my my stuff, if you're interested in the topics. Okay. Uh, my website is just my name, so petravelzebor.com. Oh, that uh, wasn't yeah. taken? <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't taken. <laughs> I got to I, get that one. So yeah, my website is my name, which is only taken by me. Uh, but also <laughs> if you if you Google Petra Mental Health, because if you can't find, if you can't spell my name, right. Petra Mental Health usually comes up with all my stuff. Um, right. And pr- primarily... I'm um, working with businesses, like I said, to support mental health culture. Uh, but I do loads of keynotes and I've got a book coming out next year. And so uh, just nice. connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions, I'm always answering myself. So please do. That's terrific. Well, Petra, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and for those listening, if you like this episode and you would like to help out the show, you can become a supporter, even if it's just once. Folks, just sign up, contribute three bucks, and cancel. And I will still send you a postcard. My wife and I make washi, which is <clears throat> Japanese paper. And uh, I mean, who doesn't like to get mail? I will send you a postcard from Japan to you, wherever you are in the world. Petra, I'd like to send you one after we get off air here. I'll get a, an address that I, uh, I'll send you a postcard. And uh, that would be great. Yeah. Actual mail. I love it. Yeah, there you go. I know nobody gets actual mail anymore unless it's a bill or something. But um, yeah. But thank you so much for your time and thanks for your story and thanks for what you do. I, I, I'm a big proponent of, you know, uh, advocating for positive mental health and uh, cause it doesn't get addressed enough. So. Agreed. Thanks so much for having me.